The yellows, the pale yellow came from the goldenrod. The darker yellow came from mixing goldenrod with some onion skins. Both of these beautiful pinkish, maroonish colors came from the pokeberries. These off-whites and the grays came from the acorns. This very weird, beautiful slate blue. I can't believe this turned out to be slate blue, but it was the acorns and put in an iron pot. So the iron changes the colors, but uh, I never dreamed it would turn out like that. And then the walnuts. Um, the walnuts gave me the best variety of colors. All of these Depending on the wool, of course, this is Icelandic wool, and it took the dye a little bit differently, just slightly, than this sheep's roving. And we've got more pale colors and golden colors. Just, just beautiful. They're all beautiful. And they were all dyed with nature. Perfect color for a little gray squirrel. And also this for the squirrel's the squirrel's belly and the highlights in the face. Well, golden colors from the walnuts are gonna make beautiful little needle felted acorns. Since we're talking about acorns and we've used acorns today, let me tell you about my view on acorns. For some reason I simply adore acorns. When I go for a walk in the woods, Instead of looking up the glorious blue sky or the silhouettes in the trees, I am scouring the ground looking for acorns. And I just have this fascination and this love for that little acorn. And so one year on my blog, I got a little silly and I wrote an ode to an acorn. And so just for a little bit of fun, let me recite that to you. Ode to an Acorn How do I love thee, little acorn? Let me count the ways. I love thee on teapots, bowls, platters, and trays. I love the acorn finial inside the potting shed. I love thy perky patterned cap atop thy acorn head. From the artist's perspective, the acorn is respected, while walnuts and filberts are woefully neglected. All those in the nut world, tis the acorn most adored, while peanuts and cashews are vehemently ignored. Indeed, little acorn, all artists sing your praises. The potter takes his sculpting tool to carve your little faces. Your image has been cast in iron. In 
and wood. And even cast in concrete, you're exceptionally good. In paint, clay, or stonework, no nut doth compare to the innocent acorn so charming and fair. And though to the human your taste is quite bitter, just the mention of your name makes tree folk twerp and twitter. Dews and muffins, too, no ordinary nut will do. Acorn souffle, acorn pie, piled way up high. Breakfast and supper and afternoon tea, scouring the grounds neath the old oak tree, they gather you acorns three by three and stash you like gold or honey from the bee. And so little nut so tried and true, from the depths of my heart I honor you. The end. Okay, so it's not Elizabeth Barrett Browning, which you have to admit, it was kind of cute. Now let's get serious and bake some acorn cookies and make an acorn out of wool. Today we are making molded gingerbread cookies. We're going to start out with three and a half cups of unbleached flour plus four tablespoons. This large copper measuring cup holds two cups of flour. One half cup of sugar, half a teaspoon of baking soda, one half teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of cloves, and a half a teaspoon of nutmegs. If you really like the taste of cloves or cinnamon or any of these spices I'm adding, you can add a little bit more. To your taste. But I'm using a half a teaspoon cloves and one half teaspoon of nutmeg. Hmm, that smells so good. It smells like autumn. Two teaspoons of ground ginger. and one and a half teaspoons of cinnamon. I'm going to mix all that together in a large bowl. One of the first things I ever baked on my own when I was a child was gingerbread. I got the recipe out of my mother's Betty Crocker cookbook. Mix that in really well and get all those spices mixed in. Set that aside and in another mixing bowl you're going to mix the wet ingredients. In a separate mixing bowl you're going to put in one half cup of vegetable oil and one cup of molasses. and two tablespoons of water. You 
You might need to add more water later. We'll just find out, see how the dough looks. Now you're going to add your dry ingredients and you can mix this by hand or you can mix it in a mixer using the flat blade, not, not the mixer blade. And you're going to mix your dough until it holds together. Oh, that's not, not too sticky at all. I'm going to knead this dough into a nice ball. It's all mixed together. You don't have to knead it too long. It's not like not like baking bread. So here you're going to put this in a nice nice ball and then we're going to put this in a plastic bag and seal it and let this rest for about an hour or we're going to refrigerate it overnight. Either way. It's really messy if you don't like flour under your hands or molasses. Just wear gloves like me. I'm going to press firmly into the surface of the dough. And then I'm going to lift it straight up. Beautiful. <laughs> and flour it up again. Now, in order to keep the impression clear like this, you're going to want to dry the dough, which means that you're going to not put these directly into the oven. You're going to let your cookies sit on the cookie sheet for at least 12 hours. As many cookies as I can out of this. And then I will Take the excess and re-roll it. This gingerbread has been drying now for about 12 hours, over 12 hours actually. So these cookies should keep their imprints pretty well. We will put them in the oven for about 12 minutes at 300 degrees. But keep an eye on them because they start to expand too much. You might have a hot oven and you might want to turn the heat down just a little. You just want them to keep those beautiful patterns. The cooking temperature makes a huge difference in the pattern on the cookie. So this cookie was baked at 300 degrees and then I lowered the heat to 200 degrees and I baked them for 10 minutes longer and you can see the difference is quite remarkable. So I would advise that you lower the temperature to 200 instead of the previous 300 that I mentioned if you want to keep that impression. I think the impression could still be even better than that. Um, I'm just going to experiment with the this oven a little more just to see. Today I'm going to needle felt some acorns and I'm going to use the walnut dyed wool. This beautiful chestnut color. It's gorgeous. might also use a little bit of this wool which was the goldenrod mixed with this chestnut wool, carded together, and I need some acorn caps, and I need some little 
felting needles. Needle felting, fe needle felting needles have little bitty barbs in them. You can't see them unless you really look closely, but they have little barbs and they come in different gauges depending on what you're felting or how much uh, wool, how deep you're going with your project. But the first thing you want to do is you want to take your little ball of wool and this is going to really condense the wool as you work it. You're going to roll it very tightly and as you roll it very tightly in a little ball, or in this case a little shape of an egg or an acorn, as you roll it tightly you're going to poke it with your needle. You'll need several different gauges of needles. It's something you just become accustomed to when you're working with the wool, because it really depends on the kind of wool you're using, how deep you're going into the wool. So you're rolling it and you're poking it with a needle very carefully. I became interested in needle felting when I was signing books at a fiber festival and the booth next to me sold all of the equipment in order to do it. So she had the needles and she had the wool and she had the knowledge and I just asked her during a slow period in the show, I asked her to show me how to do it and so she gave me about a little five minute lesson. I bought some wool. Actually, I didn't have to buy any wool, but I bought some anyway because I had sheep at the time. I had my own sheep. I had my own wool. I always I sheared my own sheep, and I always gave the wool away to people who spin and did needle felting as well. But I had absolutely no interest in needle felting until that day, and took my little needles home. And actually, from that time on, I really got interested and hooked on it. It's very time-consuming. Some would consider this very tedious, and it, and it is. It takes, it can be tedious, as you can see, just to make a little acorn like this. If you want to make a nice firm one, it can take quite a while. But to make a larger creature, I've spent as much as three weeks working on a, a possum family I made one time. A mother possum with six little babies, and... You can make do needle felting as simply or as elaborately as you like. So for me, these little acorns are basically just a, an addition to the animals that I needle felt. And that's my favorite thing to do. Now those take um, countless hours to create, but I absolutely love animals. I don't do needle felting of people. Just like in my books, they're all about animals. I used to be a wildlife artist long ago. My, actually, that's what I started out as. I did realistic wildlife art. And back when I lived in Colorado, where I grew up, but I'll tell you that... Uh, Wildlife artists were a dime a dozen where I lived, and that's when I switched from wildlife art to folk art. And then, like I said, five years ago, I started making these, my needle felted animals, which I absolutely love making. They're just like little, they come alive to me. They just come alive. Some of them are very hard for me to part with. So basically what you're doing when you're needle felting is you are sculpting wool with a needle. There are many online stores where you can buy wool, cleaned, dyed wool, if you like. Or you can get some wool from your friends who have sheep, which I used to have. I'm, I lost my last sheep last year, but I am looking at getting some Shetland sheep next year. This little acorn is ready for a cap. Once you've got a nice firm little nut, take your cap, fill it with glue, pop 
be a little nut on there and let it dry and you can you can refine it a little bit if you wish yeah now make about a dozen more <laughs> if you're up to it she looks very cute on a necklace this is a pretty good start on an acorn stash now I just need to make somebody to give them to My favorite part of making a video is when I get to sit down and have tea or a meal with you. So today we're having the gingerbread that we baked and we're having some squash soup and we're having colonial buhi tea. Now I can formally introduce you to my new little squirrel friend here, Guthrie Nettle, who is joining us today for our tea. And it is a smoky black tea. Extremely smoky. So if you like strong black tea and a lot of smoke, Oliver Pluff and Company, Colonial Buhi. He's pretty cute, I think. <laughs> I really like him. You're a pretty fine fella. Now the soup that I made today was made from spaghetti squash and it's my own recipe. I will print it down below because I didn't film myself making it. I sort of threw it together and just added certain ingredients and it turned out really, really well. As far as the cookies go, I think they turned out really beautifully. 
Now if I make this gingerbread again, I don't think I will use all that molasses. I'm going to replace about half of it with dark syrup, because unless you really love the taste of molasses, these are a little strong, but they're chewy and they're very soft, so they're very good gingerbread. The molds are Springerly molds, and I will do an entire video on making Springerly cookies probably in the next couple weeks. We reviewed this tea once before, Oliver Pluff's Colonial Buhi. It's a dark black tea and smoky, very smoky. But it's really great on an autumn day to drink a smoky tea because it just warms you right up. Maybe it's all in your mind, or maybe it's only in taste buds. Not sure. That's <laughs> it's a very good tea. Oliver Pluff and Company. You can go online. They're from Charleston, South Carolina. Our beautiful dinnerware today is the Victorian English Pottery, 1819. And I chose it, believe it or not, not just because of the acorns, but because I love those brown hairs in the middle of this plate. But you can see all beautiful acorn motifs all around the edges. These are so great for autumn. Some of them have foxes, some of them have turkeys, some of them have deer, but look at those gorgeous little acorns. And this beautiful handmade pottery pie plate, which is a cookie plate today, was something I picked up at one of the art shows. Unfortunately, all they signed on the bottom was SW, so I can't tell you who the artist was, but you can see how beautiful that is. And of course, you know why I picked it. I really lucked out on this teapot. It's another Bordello Pintiero teapot. And I just got it for a real bargain. Ten dollars. Plus shipping, of course. But ten dollars for this beautiful Bordello Pintiero that can add to my collection of that particular dinnerware, which I really love. You can use it at any time of the year. It's just very lovely. Green is the color. Now the illustrations that I used are from this book, The Journey of Bushki Bushy Bottom. This was a book that I did in 2008. It's got a great fold-out page. But this is the story of a little squirrel who's been blown out of his treehouse during a windstorm. The wind has carried him far from home, and Bushki has to use his own initiative and determination to find his way back home again. So this is an adventure story. It's also a seek and find book. It's available on my website, and actually to this day it's still one of my very, very favorite books. It's just full of delicious details, or as I call them, persnickety detail. But the idea for this book actually came from a little squirrel that I raised many years ago that was blown out of his tree or his nest during a windstorm. And my son brought him in, put him on my shoulder, and I raised him by feeding him with a needle dropper and then he graduated to baby food and I raised him from the time he was just a tiny little baby until he was grown up. And then when he did grow up he went free in Hopalong Hollow. Illustrating books is one of my favorite things to do but I've been doing this a lot longer than I've been needle felting so you can understand why once I discovered needle felting it just went so beautifully with my books. And although these creatures are actually collectibles made for adults, they're not for, they're not toys for children, but they just go so perfectly with my mindset here in Hopalong Hollow. If you'd like to pursue uh, dyeing with natural materials, this is a pretty good book. It's called The Wild Dyer by Abigail Booth. And there are many other books on the same subject. And I really want to thank all of you that leave comments and that subscribe. 
I consider you my fellow Hop Along Hello folk. And so many of you are so kind and you, you send me seeds and you send me flowers and you send me all kinds of wonderful things. But this was pretty a pretty amazing coincidence because the person that sent me this had no idea I was going to do a video concerning acorns. And about three days before I started loading the video, this wonderful door knocker came in the mail for me. So I want to say thank you, Bev. This was just, this is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. <laughs> and anyway, okay, so hey, thank you for coming again, coming along. For the ride, uh, we did a lot of things today, and we'll see you next time. From Hopalong Hollow, this is Jerry. Bye.